Hey, everybody. I'm coming to you from Tennessee today. I know the, the background is not the normal thing you see in my headquarters that I usually produce from. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm on travel for some family issues. And as I said, I'm actually going to be out of the country here later in the week. Uh, but there's some things continuing to happen on the ground in Russia. Actually, a lot of things happening. And I, I don't want to wait days to keep you updated uh, because I know you need the ground truth. And, and that's what we're here to give you. Uh, first of all, we, the, the big news again today is that the Russians continue to move uh, south from their attack into the northern part of Ukraine, north of Kharkiv area. Uh, and especially there's there's two basic thrusts that are going on. One just uh, basically just north of Kharkiv, a little bit to the east of that, and then to the west, uh, centering on a town called Volvchansk. You're going to be hearing about that a lot in the news and later in this same episode here, because that seems to be one of the primary objectives of the initial thrust here. And we're going to talk about how that fits into the bigger picture as we go on here today. But first of all, I want to show you, uh, this is a video of what uh, uh, President Zelensky said uh, yesterday, kind of given the implication that, hey, don't worry about this, we got it all covered. Our forces must achieve maximum results to destroy our enemy everywhere. Today, there were reports from our Commander-in-Chief, Oleksandr Sirsky. We are strengthening our positions, especially in the Kharkiv region, by deploying additional forces. The artillery is operating exactly as planned. So, again, if you saw our last update, his, his body language is exactly filling us with a lot of confidence that he actually believes the things that he's saying and for good reason. Uh, Gear, if you can put that first map up there, uh, because you can see that, you know, this is territory. All these things in the white are things that have been taken just within the last few days uh, and, and that continues to move further to the south. You see, there's those two areas I told you about one in the east and the other around Volchansk. Uh, and, it, and it continues to move further down. And there's some problems with how rapidly this has moved so far. You know, the, the war has been, especially this year and even some to last year, has been characterized uh, a lot by slow movements and, and incremental changes here and there and a meters potential here. Sometimes it gets slowed down. This one has been surprising many people with how rapidly they pushed in some places up to 10 kilometers deep over a front of now expanding the total of about 20 kilometers wide. And by all accounts, so far, the main forces of the Russian forces have not yet been engaged. These are what's called reconnaissance in force. I used to be a reconnaissance officer uh, with the what we call the Armored Cav Squadron where you would be required to go and enforce to find out where the enemy defenses were, find out what their dispositions were, uh, and then the main forces would follow on behind. Once you've identified where the weaknesses are, then they would come in. Ordinarily, the, the cavalry units, the reconnaissance units, would come in and they would just uh, you know, make minimal gains basically to find out where the enemy is, and then they would bring the bigger forces in. But in this case, the reconnaissance forces themselves have had significant uh, success and results in relatively small numbers. And that's, of course, raising a big question. How could this be? How after more than two years of warfare and knowing that Russia has had forces up in this uh, portion of the of the front for for many, many months, and there's been warnings from the Ukrainian intelligence that they're going to open up a northern offensive at some point, where are all the defenses? That's a big question that a lot of other people are asking. Uh, and in fact, uh, here is uh, the, the head of the Volchansk area asking some of those to actually no, this particular one here. The head of the Volchansk defensive area uh, is showing you how heavy the firepower is in this area. The situation is extremely difficult because the enemy has been conducting mass shelling of the town, terrorizing the civilian population, destroying the town. They use artillery and multiple launch rocket systems. There were 30 airstrikes just in the last day. There's a lot of destruction. And that is leading to a little bit more eyes being opened by the president. So the clip I showed you a second ago was from yesterday. Here's a clip of today where he's actually for the first time that I've seen in a long time being pretty honest about what he's facing. Special attention is paid to the Kharkiv region. Defensive battles are ongoing, fierce battles on a large part of our border area. There are villages that have actually turned from a gray zone into a combat zone, and the occupier is trying to gain a foothold in some of them, or simply use some of them for further advancement. In particular, on the outskirts of Vovchansk, the situation is extremely difficult. 
The city is under constant Russian fire, and our military is carrying out counterattacks, helping local residents. We are also paying constant attention to other areas of combat operations, including the Donetsk sector, where the situation is no less intense. In fact, the idea behind the attacks in the Kharkiv region is to spread our forces thin and undermine the moral and motivational basis of the Ukrainians' ability to defend themselves. The Pokrovsk direction is the most difficult, despite everything. You know, as I, I've been telling you for a long time, it's not the money, it's the men. It's not the machines, it's not even the ammunition, it's the manpower issue. And that is absolutely playing out in, in a very stark way right now. Ukraine simply doesn't have the manpower to be able to handle this additional front and move reinforcements. I'm going to show you some graphic reasons why that is in just a second. But that underlies the, the weakness of the Ukraine side, of, even in addition to having the they're being outgunned and, and out ammunitioned uh, by the Russian side here. And, and I think probably one of the big questions that Zelensky himself is asking is, where was my defenses? Where were the people that were supposed to stop this invasion? And here is the reconnaissance leader for the Ukrainian side. Uh, I'm going to show you in just a second where he's asking some of the same questions. He was uh, interviewed, I believe it was on BBC earlier today about saying, hey, what's going on up here? And he's asking these same questions. Ukrainian officials insist they were ready. Not everyone agrees. This drone footage appears to show Russian troops crossing the border unopposed. There was no first line of defense. We saw it. The Russians just walked in. Where were the minefields? They just walked in. Look, if, if anybody ever had any doubt about how powerful a good defense can be, they should have looked at the Ukrainian offensive in 2023 because Russia spent about six months to nine months in some areas of the front building these elaborate defensive fortifications, multiple lines all the way across. Now, I've been hearing and reading uh, from Ukrainian mil uh, media for months, going back into last year, that toward the end of the year when they finally gave up and, and acknowledged that the offensive didn't work, that they started building defensive positions. And, and in the first, especially January, February, I read lots of reports about how they were strengthening up the entire border because they saw this growing force that the Russians had were building a northern army, uh, being very open about what was coming. And so the assumption is, my assumption was, that they were doing the same things the Russians did and that there would be very heavy minefields, uh, there would be tank ditches, there would be dragon's teeth, you know, all these kinds of things that I fully expected. But now that you see that, that video there, the guy literally walked across the field, I mean, those, those platoons. And that apparently is not isolated. That is happening all across there. And there simply haven't been the defensive positions. It's as though they don't exist or they don't exist in sufficient quantities or quality. So now then when you have Russia coming in this far, uh, as Zelensky pointed out in his second one there, they are moving reinforcements uh, from other parts of the front. Here's the problem. They don't have theater reserves. They don't have enough people that they can take entire brigades and move them from one place to another, or that they were out of contact, you know, waiting in case there had been a breakthrough, which is normal military procedure, so that you could fill in the gaps in a sort of a fire brigade type environment to where if something broke out, you have somebody ready right now as a fire truck to go and put that fire out. There don't seem to be any. So what Ukraine is doing instead is they're taking people from the other parts of the front uh, and they're taking the brigades that are there. And they can't afford to take entire brigades out of the line because Russia already has a lot of pressure all along that front line. And so they can't go back uh, and, and just take them away. They don't have any new ones. So what are they going to do? This illustrates the problem. You see that Russia's already all along those lines. Now, you just forgive me here. This is from a Ukraine source. So these are these are not in English, but uh, that's Kharkiv in the area around the blue in the upper left hand corner with you see that yellow arrow up there. That's Kharkiv. And then the, the right hand side there is the Kupiansk area, the northern part of, of the uh, of the eastern front that, that we've been talking about so much here. This illustrates the problem. Ukraine is taking those yellow areas, arrows are troop movements. So they are going to have to figure out the brigades that they have defending their front up there, which, by the way, in the northern sector has been quite successful. They're going to have to now move uh, reinforcements from elsewhere up to there. But since they don't have entire brigades, they're going to have to take like squads or platoons from each of the individual brigades to move them up there. And it's a desperate situation because if Ukraine doesn't put them up there fast, the city of Kharkiv could be surrounded 
very, very quickly, uh, much more quickly than anybody uh, would even imagine based on how the war has gone the first two and plus years of this war so far. So that, though, is, it shows the real problem. And I think why Zelensky was concerned in that second video, because that means that the other areas of the front, Gary, if you can fill that map back up there again, that shows that these other areas, like especially around Kupiansk, where it's so important. Uh, the other one, Gary. The, no, the one you had just a second ago, that one. All right, I'll pick it back up from here. And as you can see on the map right here, the, the, you can't just pull these units in, in large proportion out because the, all the pressure that Russia has, you see all those little red triangle or square looking things. Those are individual brigades on the Russian side. And Ukraine has been doing a really good job up in this point so far with uh, tying in existing defensive positions with their forces that they've been fighting and the experience they've had. Well, now then if they weaken each of these brigades that they have defending there to go and stop Kharkiv uh, assault, then now then the Russians are going to gain an upper hand here. And that's just one area. That's in the northern sector. I can show you the same thing in the central and in the southern sector. There's three main areas where this is starting to be a problem. And now then we see the potential for there to be a break in the Ukrainian lines. One of the things I've been talking about for a long time, and I think that may be one of the prime objectives of this operation here, is that by opening up a new front, and if Russia genuinely does have another 40 to 50,000 troops in that area that can reinforce and exploit any breaks in the north and start to really put Kharkiv in danger, then that could give even more pressure on Kiev to move entire units out of other sectors to try and stop that. But you see, you run out of firemen, so to speak, the fire brigade idea, you don't have enough fire brigades. So then something's got to give. You're either going to give in here in the east or you're going to give in in the north. But it appears that unless something changes pretty quick, that Ukraine will be in real danger of not having enough men to defend the whole thing, whereas Russia does appear to have enough men in the offensive. Now, there's many things still yet to go, and we're not completely sure how a lot of things are going to play out. This is only like day four, basically, since they started. Uh, so it's still possible that Ukraine maybe can move some reserves up from the western part of the country, people who have not been in, engaged before, that uh, maybe had been in territorial defense or, or even uh, in some of the other areas where Russia may not have come in. So they may be moving them to try not, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul kind of situation from the eastern front. And maybe that will work. They Perhaps they could hold it up if they get both more ammunition and more men and uh, but uh you see it's still it's going to be a net net uh loss for the ukraine side and especially if some reports that i saw just before coming on air here that there remains a, a grouping of the russians north of sumi which have not yet done anything and if they open up yet another new front up there and start making penetrations then you see you just run out of troops really quick and i don't know how ukraine uh is going to stop that one and that is uh, what we're watching right now, um, and it just it's just a chess game uh, and even a checkers game to try right now just to stop the bleeding. I mean, this is a crisis for the Ukraine side. It's, it's bigger than what I think a lot of people think. Maybe they can stop the bleeding. Maybe they can get this thing back into an attritional environment. But right now, Russia, for the first time in the, since the opening round of the war, is making some pretty big moves inward. Now, the other thing I want to talk about uh, real briefly while we're here today you may have heard that the Russians have uh, changed their defense minister. Sergei Shoigu was uh, basically relieved of command. He was given a title of he's moving into the national security, whatever. But that's it, basically just saying, yeah, you're done and we're going to you know, be nice to you because uh, you may not be aware. But uh, Shoigu and Putin have a long personal history, many, many, many years. He's been a big ally of his. So he's not just going to put him out to pasture. Uh, but this signals a few things that I want to talk about real briefly because I know people are wondering what's behind all this. Uh, and, and I think that this actually goes back to something that happened almost exactly a year ago when uh, then Yevgeny Prigozhin, who was the leader of the Wagner Group, had some huge issues with the senior leaders, especially of Shoigu, uh, and, and just enumerated a bunch of things in public very much out loud about problems he had with the way Russia was conducting the war, things he said the Russian army wasn't doing, that his forces were doing. He was being almost uniquely successful uh, in, the, in the Bakhmut area, whereas the rest of the Russian army was just moving inches or not moving at all. Uh, and, and that was a big problem to Prigozhin, which he put open. Now, of course, as you know, I think a month or two later, uh, he led a, a, he got so angry, he led a, a 
what appeared to be a top possible coup into, into Russia, into, up into Moscow, which was, the, was stopped. Uh, Putin got really angry about it. They said, OK, well, we just kind of had our you know, discussion about it. Uh, and you know, allegedly on the surface, everything was fine. And then Prigozhin mysteriously is killed a few months later in a very mysterious, not mysterious plane crash. Now, I thought at the time that many of Prigozhin's, again, just speaking from a purely military perspective, Prigozhin's arguments were valid. Many of the things he was complaining about to the to the leader, the guy who planned all this operation, many of the things I've told you about, especially in the early phases of the war, were huge strategic blunders by the Russian side, major mistakes. And who's that but the guy at the top? He's the one who approves all these operations. He's the one who gets the troops ready. So all the things that they had done wrong, really the buck stops there if the guy at the top who's in charge of it. But I also thought there's no way that Putin can basically do what Prigozhin said and fire him at the time. I, I thought that he would probably have kind of distance him from it, maybe get some other people to start doing some things different to listen to what Prigozhin said and part putting those things into operation. Now, there is evidence, and we're not going to know any of this for sure until probably many years from now when, when our, uh, people can go through archives and talk to different people to find out. But uh, from what I can observe, it really seems to me that Russia did make some of the changes, that the Russian army itself took on some of the operation tactics that were successful for Gozhin. And now you see, uh, especially over the last six or so, six or eight months, has been a lot more effective tactically. And now then I think that uh, finally, a year later, when it can be made like, OK, well, this is just because Putin has a new administration and he's bringing some new people in. And so that's why he's changing him out. And he's done a good job, whatever they'll be saying publicly. But I think this is the good time for him to use that excuse to say, all right, we're going to get rid of it. Now, I, I want to show you, we're showing a little bit of it on the screen here, but uh, I want to actually play this. This is what Prigozhin said in, uh, I think this one is from May of 2023. Check this out. We have a so he was very animated about that and of course went on to say uh you know that that you guys should be fired and you should come down in front of the front line and all this and then i told you what happened subsequent to that now there was i think this morning in, in deutsche Welle, the german station uh there was another analyst who kind of thinks the same kind of thing he thinks that may have had something to do with this check this out about a year ago, there was this uh, mutiny of the Prigozhin Wagner group uh, that we don't hear anymore in the news, but which was very influential a year ago or two years ago when the Russian war, uh, big invasion started, that mercenary group. So uh, Prigozhin attacked the defense minister and the head of the general staff um, very harshly, very, um, he humiliated them uh, both actually. So um, observers were expecting um, a resignation of Shegu last year, but he's a very close ally uh, of Vladimir Putin. That's why he kept him for a year. And now we see that that actually happened because really short of what I, that, that uh, theory there, there's really no other reason to get show you out. I mean, every, I mean, look, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, he's been in office for, what, 20-something years? He just got re-upped re as well. So, given the way Russia normally operates, there's a reason. It's not just because, well, I want to put him into a different position in the National Security Council. And then they've elevated a guy who's primarily uh, a, a, a financial guy, actually. He's, he's good at numbers. He's good at industry. Uh, and I think that kind of shows you where Russia is going right now is that they're saying, hey, I want to bring in somebody who's going to even further strengthen our industrial capacity. Somebody who's got a lot of experience with that. Of course, naturally, he also does have a close relationship with Putin going back many years, somebody that he can trust at the top. Uh, but, you know, now then they are really saying we're just going to continue to expand our defense industrial base and all the strengths we've made in, in, in building more jets. They've actually been building more uh, fighter jets. Uh, tanks, artillery pieces, and certainly artillery ammunition, drones of all different calibers and categories, uh, and then, of course, missiles and uh, Kinzel missiles, the hypersonics, all that, that's where their focus is. And as I've been telling you many times, the uh, quantitative and qualitative advantage that Russia has over the Ukraine side is just going to continue to grow over time. And that's what we're seeing here. And now then we're seeing on the front, uh, especially with what's going on in the north, what may yet be going on north of Sumy and what is already going on in the eastern front. 
uh, there's a number of places where Russia continues to push back because while everybody's focused up on the north, all the fighting in the east is continuing on and Russia continues to methodically move forward there as well. So uh, it's a very dangerous time for Ukraine. I think you saw that in Zelensky's voice. Uh, and I think that it's for good reason and just reinforces my position now, 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 now is the time for the West to recognize what's going on, acknowledge reality, seek a negotiated settlement on the best terms available. Every day you wait, the, the conditions get worse for Ukraine and the deal will get worse for Kiev. And, and the less likely Putin is when he's making this progress to even want to have a negotiated settlement without actually gaining more territory in the negotiations. And that's entirely possible, too. And as bad as that would be, the worst thing we could do is to continue to ignore and hope and fantasy that these very fundamental things magically reverse, because then Ukraine is going to lose even more men, more territory and get more cities destroyed like Volchansk is right now. That's where we are. Thank you very much for joining us today. Sorry for this odd background here, but uh, keeping you guys informed is more important to me than, than uh, just weren't than taking the weekend off. We're going to continue to bring this uh, information to you. And if anything else breaks, you can count on us wherever I happen to be in the world. We're going to bring it to you. Thanks. And we'll see you on the next episode. Daniel Davis, Deep Dive.